Another very important and quite obvious characteristic of digitalization is that digital information nowadays inherently lives in a network structure. Before the internet, basically there were these data silos, so databases already existed in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, uh, but they were not really connected and the internet allowed to connect these different data silos and send information around them. And what helped much more to connect them is the World Wide Web, which was invented by Tim Berners-Lee in 1989. So both of them are networks. The internet, you can imagine more like the physical connection among these different data points. And the World Wide Web is kind of like a service layer that more flexibly allows you to jump from one to the other. Check out this little video here to understand a little bit better about the difference between these two fundamental networks, the Internet and the World Wide Web. The fact that digital information lives in a network structure is so important because society itself also follows a network logic. Actually, society is a network. It's a network of individuals, of organizations, of institutions, and of technology. And when we study society, it's very useful to take a network approach, and digital information fits into this approach one-to-one -one and, and, and merges with it. For example, this here is the visualization of a digital network of mine. It's my LinkedIn network at a certain point. And it's very close to, actually, it's a reflection of what I, at that point, would have considered my really my professional network. For example, down here in the blue, these are colleagues from the United Nations Secretariat, where I used to work for 10 years. These, this green cluster here are specifically colleagues from the United Nations in Latin America. And here, this little red cluster here, these are colleagues and friends from Chile, where I used to live for over 10 years working for the United Nations. And you can see that they hang pretty close together. So my Chilean friends, together with my Latin American UN colleagues, with the rest of the UN colleagues. Down here in this other cluster, you can see a lot of colleagues from USC, where I used to, to work uh, for four years at the University of Southern California. And these here are students that I had at USC. And actually, that's also how I think actually about my professional network. And these digital networks are a reflection, a visualization of that. Now, we can use these networks to do really formal quantitative analysis of to see, well, who hangs with whom and who is close with whom in, in your personal network or in social networks. And we do that all the time. Humans are great natural network analysts. You do this, for example, you know, these typical conversations or these thoughts that we're having when we, for example, say, you know, let's let's go to the movies tomorrow a and let's invite him as well. But, but wait, if we wait, if we invite him, we also have to invite her because obviously they are connected. But if we invite her, she is connected to her. But this connection is not really good. So if we invite her, we cannot really talk about her, but then we could talk about her because they are, but that's kind of like awkward because they don't have the same friends. What we do here is we do a network analysis in our head. And we do this all the time. For example, if I tell you, think about your family. Who is part of your family? What you did just now is you created a network in your head. And they're interesting questions. For example, are cousins, are you, do you have cousins? Are your cousins part of this network? Do you have uncles or aunts? Are they part of this network? All of them? Where are they located in this network? So what we do is we draw these networks and the idea is now that given that digital networks reveal these networks that we have naturally in our head, let's reveal them, let's look at them and let's study them. Let's make a science of it. This is usually called social network analysis. Let's explore some exploratory metrics of social network analysis to give you a basic idea of how that works. For example, social networks are usually characterized by a surprisingly small average path length. That means that information can on average flow from one node to the network to any other node by undertaking very few steps only. So it's a small average path length. That information flows to this network. This was discovered and pioneered or, or first time uh, officially proved by a social science researcher called Stan Milgram, 
who in the 1960s had the idea to take a bunch of letters, which he gave to about 300 people in Kansas and Nebraska, and he told them, send the letter to somebody you know who might know this merchant who lives in Boston, Massachusetts. Well, if you were lucky enough to know this random merchant, then you just send the letter directly to him. If not, you said, well, he's a merchant. He lives in Massachusetts. I might send it to somebody who lives a little bit closer. Now, the 300 letters, 64 letters actually reached the target person. And on average, it took about five to six people to process this message. And this is then known nowadays as the six degrees of separation. So it takes six degrees to go from one person to another person, who all of which know each other. There's also the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. You're invited to research that yourself, but it's a, it's a very related concept. Uh, on Facebook, actually, as it turns out, the average path length is 4.7. It's less than five. So it's less than five degrees of separation. That means basically on Facebook, Everybody is connected with everybody through the friend of a friend of a friend of a friend who might have a friend or not. So it's between four and five degrees of separation. And that actually should not be too surprising if you really look at the math behind it. So, for example, how many friends do you have on Facebook? Well, okay, let's say you have a hundred unique friends. A hundred friends that also your friends don't have because you have friends in common. Let's say you have a hundred unique friends that, that your friends do not have. So then you have a hundred and let's imagine your friends, they also have a hundred unique friends that you don't know. So a hundred times a hundred, you're already at a network of 10,000 nodes. Let's say the friends of your friends have also a hundred friends that you don't have and that they don't have. So now you're already at a network of a million nodes. Now, if you go a fourth degree of separation out, you're already at a hundred million nodes. And at the fifth degree of separation, you are at 10 billion nodes. How many people are there on planet Earth? Right, there are less than 10 billion. So actually five degrees of separation following this logic are more than enough to reach everybody, the last person in Africa and the last person in China through this network logic. A small average path length is also one of the two characteristics of a phenomenon known as the small world phenomena. Uh, this is actually a funny association to the fact that people always are so surprised when, when they find that they know somebody who knows somebody and then they say the phrase, oh, what a small world. For example, you're at a cocktail party and you talk with somebody and your, your conversation partner suddenly stops you and says, what? You're talking about Jimmy? That's the same Jimmy who is the boyfriend of the classmate of my cousin. Well, let's check that. So he's the boyfriend of the classmate of your cousin who he knows. So these are already four degrees of separation. According to this logic, you get to a hundred million people there. That's a third of the United States. And Jimmy happens to be part of this third of it. That shouldn't actually be too surprising if you would follow this logic, but it surprises people. So the small world phenomena, one of the two characteristics is the small average path length that is characteristic for social networks. Another characteristic of social networks is what is known as homophily. That's actually a beautiful word. It means love of the like, or to say it with a very old saying, birds of a feather flock together. And it has to do with the fact that people who have the same characteristics usually also hang together. So if you draw it out in a network logic, nodes who are alike, they also connect with people who are like them. For example, here you see a friendship network of a school class by race. That's an offline network. It's really a, a normal school class. And you see that it's separated by race. So black and white are actually separated in, in two very separate groups. 
In, in online networks, this has become a very pervasive phenomenon because, for example, in political blogs, the like-minded is only one click away. So why should I waste my time arguing and discussing with people who don't agree with me? I just leave the chat room and go to another chat room where everybody agrees with me. And that's where you get this phenomenon of polarization. But also what happens if you only talk with like-minded, actually extremism starts to happen. Because if you only talk with people who think like you, you start to actually go further down this road and opinions drift apart. So homophily is a very interesting and also very delicate phenomena to study in offline and in online networks. Homophily also allows us to infer nodes from their links or links from their nodes. So if I know who you connect with, I know who you are. And if I know who you are, I know who you're likely to connect with. For example, in this study here, they showed that without any information about the Facebook user beyond a list of his friends, you could accurately predict the sexual orientation. Now, once you study networks, for example, a network like this here, and you really start to measure who connects with whom and by how far who connects with whom, you start to get a really quantitative understanding of some phenomena that we often talk about in social systems. For example, things like gatekeeper, broker, intermediary, bottleneck, coordinator, bridge, Amplifier. These are all concepts that we sometimes use. Well, he's an intermediate, but what does it really mean to be an intermediary? But in a network sense, you can actually measure how much intermediary somebody is. It depends on the network position and the network role that you have. And you can also come up with new characteristics. We won't go through them here, but for example, a study that I recently was working on, this is an online Twitter network from a social protest in Chile. And what we started to understand here that there are two kinds of communicator in this network. One we called voices. We just called them voices. We made this up. These are big media outlets that communicate a message. And then you have these kind of amplifiers. These are celebrities that during the social protest in Chile took a message from a media outlet and amplified it. And there are some Twitter users who get their news only from the celebrity. So it's an interesting new communication landscape that you can now quantitatively study by really digging down, rolling up your sleeves and studying these network structure. And digital networks reveal this underlying network structure. Now, there's no need for you to know these different uh, terms and also different researchers use them differently in there. But the fact of the matter is that network allow you to give a quantitative meaning to all of them. I want to introduce one of them to you. And that has to do with the question, who's the center of a network? So for example, here you have a network. And who do you think is the center of this network? Is it node number one, two, or three? Well, going scientifically about it, we really have to have a quantitative metric of saying, well, this is more in the center than the other ones. One way we could go about it, we just say the center is the most popular kid on the block. So, so, so the, the, the node with the most connections. So we count how many connections a node has, and we count now who is the node with the most connection. Is it one, two, or three? Node number two has two connections. Node number three has three connections. Node number one has four connections. So actually, it is justifiable to say that node number one is the center of the network. It's the most popular node in our network. But there are other ways you can go about it. For example, you can say the center of a network is the node that is closest to all the other nodes. That means you count the degrees of separation from one node to another, and then you basically count, well, which one is the closest node. Let me start with this first one. So node number one, he has one degree of separation to these three nodes here. So that's one times three. He has no degree of separation, of separation to itself. One step 
to go from 1 to 2, 2 steps to go from 1 to 3, and then there are 3 steps here, 4 steps here, 5 steps here, and that happened twice. So I sum this all up, and we get 30 steps, 30 degrees of separation to go from the node number 1 to everybody else. Let's do it now for node number 2. So node number 2 has two steps to go to these three here. So it happens three times, two, two steps times three. Then one step to go from two to one. Zero steps to go from two to two. One step to go from two to three. And then to go from two to these here, that's two steps, three steps, four steps. And that happens two times up here and down here. So you sum them all up. That's 26 steps. So actually, close, uh, node number two is closer to everybody than node number one. Node number three, you do. Please go ahead and really count them. So how many steps do you need to go from node number three to everybody else? Okay, let's count them. You need three steps to go from number three to these three here, and you do that three times with these three nodes, so it's three times three. Then you need two steps to go from three to one, one step to go from three to two, you don't need any step to go from three to three, and then to go to these here, you need one step, two steps, three steps, and you do that two times, one step, two steps, three steps. In total, you get 24 steps. So actually, node number three is closest to everybody else. So following this metric, number three is the center of the network. And even so, visually, we might think like, well, number two is obviously the center. I just showed you two ways that justify that either one or three is the center and two is not. These are known as degree centrality. You just count the numbers of degrees of links and closeness centrality. It has to do with how close you are to the other ones. But there are many others that are just as reasonable and just as justifiable. For example, one very common one is called betweenness centrality. That counts that if you go from every node to every other node on the shortest path, how often do you have to pass by a specific node? This node is most often between all other nodes. That's why it's called betweenness centrality. That's very important to calculate, for example, if you want to know who is a potential bottleneck or who is an indispensable intermediary. Uh, so then you calculate the between a centrality. It takes a lot of effort to do that by hand. I don't let you do it here, but that's why we have these computers. Uh, they make it really easy to calculate something like between a centrality. Another very famous one is called eigenvector centrality that got famous uh, through Google's PageRank. So Google PageRank is based on the idea that it's not the numbers of friends that you have immediately, not the number of links that a web page has, but if the web page that linked to the web page itself has many links to it. So it's kind of like if you have many friends, but they're all hermits, then it's, you wouldn't get a lot of point in eigenvector centrality. But if you have friends who themselves have many friends, then your eigenvector centrality would be pretty high. So that's how Google actually ranks also the pages. Uh, if you do a, a search on, on the Google search engine, and uh, it's a very important indicator. For example, it turns out that if you want to diffuse an innovation or spread a rumor, the eigenvector centrality is a very efficient way. So you would identify the people who have high eigenvector centrality, and that's where you would spread the rumor or the political opinion or the new product that you want to launch. Because the people who themselves have many friends, then this leads to a multiplier effect going through them. And with that, your innovation reaches a lot of people very, very quickly.